just one sort of hit me, being that I'm the moderator of the business meetings and you know, pretty much come to every business meeting and everything. And I, I think it's just, uh, it makes, it makes me want to think, and I hope it will make you want to think about Christ and his position in the church. Imagine that you're at a church business meeting. The news isn't good. The church treasury reports offerings for the month were lower than anticipated. If she pays the mortgage, she will be unable to settle the bills for the new hot water heater. And the electric work that we had occurred last month won't be able to be paid. If this trend continues, paying wages will be difficult. People began a lively debate about the church's financial priorities. The buildings and the grounds committee informed the president that the primary air conditioning in the sanctuary may not last through the summer. The roof over the fellowship hall is, is leaking in spots and needs repair. And an animated uh, conversation commences questioning everything. It's why didn't we carry extended warranties on this? And why didn't we do this, and why didn't we do that? The men's ministry leader says the only three men that a man attended the last month's breakfast. So I think we're just going to suspend that until we get our attendance back, and more will be coming. Suddenly, the room exploded with noise. The doors to the auditorium burst open. And the lights flooded the room to everyone amazement. Jesus Christ, majesty, enters. His hair is brilliant white. His face shines so bright it is blinding. A razor-sharp two-edged sword protrudes from his mouth, and the eyes are blaze of fire. Everyone instantly falls to the ground in awe of the sight. Christ makes his way to the front of the auditorium and sits down. And he says, continue. Would you think the tone of the business meeting would suddenly change if you were in effect of that? Would there be any more arguing and disagreements? Would people be leaving <coughs> feeling positive or negative? Because of Christ presence. How could there be in this kingdom nothing is important than Christ? All the other things are just trivial. That business team would be most likely exciting, encouraging, upbeat gathering of the church history. Why? Because the risen Christ would be present and his presence changes everything. Why can't we have that flavor right now? Christ walked through those doors. Would our demeanor change? Would we, would, be, would we be more upbeat? Would we put all our pettiness beside things that are happening, whether it has to do with the building, or about this, or about that? You know, should we have lines in the parking lot? Should we have a new sign? Should we paint this, paint something? And if he came in and told us, folks, we just need to take care of God's business <coughs> of spreading the gospel to each and every one. So I just want you to take that to heart. Christ didn't walk through those doors in this brightness and color and like it was described here, but Christ did walk through those doors in each and every one of our hearts. But just think about that. Are we proud that Christ is in us? And how are we going to exemplify Christ and raise him up? Amen. We're going to be having another movie night. Have we decided on a date on that, Kevin? Yes. <coughs> what date is that? It's Friday, March 18th. 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 Okay. So Friday, March 18th, put that on your calendar, Ms. Bobby, we'll get that into the bulletin. Um, it's Woodlawn, and I would encourage you to, uh, to go to YouTube and watch some trailers, and then if you are on uh, social media, 
start posting it, that uh, we're going to be having it here at the church. We're trying to do this to reach out into the community, to bring unchurched people in and expose them to not only Elk Ridge Baptist Church, but more importantly, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a, a good opportunity uh, for those that have attended the last two. You know, I don't, I, I don't get up here and preach, and we don't uh, pass a plate. And so for folks that are afraid of church, just tell them we reinforce the ceiling so it won't fall in when they come. It's been a long time. And, and free popcorn and free drinks and, and free snacks. And, um, you know, family of four to the movie theater is probably going to uh, put a bad debt on a $100 bill. And here you come for free. So we encourage you to do that. Um, and then uh, if you want to have things to pass out, uh, Ms. Robin is working on that. Um, we've even, uh, some churches even print up tickets. Not that we charge for them, but just have something to put in your hand. So keep that in mind, but I would encourage you to get familiar with the trailers. They've got several of them out there. And then, if you're, again, if you're doing social media, start posting it and inviting people to come for Friday night, March 18th. All right, Brother Jerry, you come. Our technology up to speed here. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you here. Conversations with God. Now, this is uh, continuing in the series, follow-up to War Room, the uh, story about prayer, the movie we saw. Um, very well received in the country. If you did not have opportunity to see it, I encourage you to check it out from the office. And uh, we have a copy. The church does have a copy. And you're more than welcome to check that out. Uh, we're going to try and do these movie nights on a regular basis, as I mentioned a little bit ago, as an outreach into the community. In your bulletin, you will find uh, a place to take a few notes. Uh, hopefully, I'll say something worth uh, writing down, but there'll be some <coughs> in the blanks there. Get in the game! Figured that I'd go ahead and pull this, uh, this thing in with uh, Super Bowl. Big deal going on later this afternoon. And I think there are some things that we can look at that will help us relate to our Christian life and in uh, athletics. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. It's in your bulletin. It's on uh, the screen. It will be in a moment here. There it is. Athletes in training are very strict with themselves. Exercising self-control over desires, and for what? For a wreath that soon withers, or is crushed, or is simply forgotten? Now this is uh, at the start of the Olympic Games in Greece, where they got that thing they got to wear around their head made out of leaves. That's what this is referring to. But whether you know any of the sports uh, that major sports, they have a prize that they're seeking. That is not our race. We run for the crown that we will wear for eternity. So, don't, so I don't run aimlessly. I don't let my eyes drift off the finish line. When I box, I don't throw punches in the air. <coughs> Verse 27, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after all this, after I have brought the gospel to others, I will still be qualified to win the race. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you take these words and we pray that you would help us in our lives as we compare what athletes go through for a prize here on earth. But Lord, we're fighting for eternity. We just pray that we would take lessons and change our lives where we can and where we should. In your name we ask. Amen. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you realize that there's no way this is ever going to be an intelligent conversation? They're not picking up what you're putting down. Their gates are down and the lights are flashing, but there isn't a train coming. <laughs> their belt doesn't go through all the loops. There's too much yardage between their goalposts. The laptop's on them, but there's no internet connection. You didn't get the idea? I heard a term this week, a computer term I guess it is, it's called the problem, that someone had a problem and they, it was diagnosed as an ID10T, 
anyone know? ID10T, we got one back. Okay, two computer guys. Well, for the rest of you, ID10T is idiot. idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Many times we cause our own problems. Big game today, and I, you know, whether you can be watching it or not, I'm. I like the commercials more than anything else. I record it uh, so that, that I don't miss the commercials. And it's very interesting. Uh, up north, we used to have a big Super Bowl party at the church. This is back in the 80s. And we used to have a big Super Bowl party at the church. We had a 20-foot screen. And, and I mean, it was just everybody from the church came out, and everybody brought food, and it was just it was amazing, and folks that wanted to sit in the auditorium and watch the game could, and those that wanted to go in there and the kids could go out. It was a wonderful thing. Well, the NFL uh, is pretty jealous of their logo, and so they, in 2008, as a matter of fact, they sent out a letter to a number of churches and said, no, 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 you're not going to do that anymore. That is our right, and you're going to have to pay. Well, when we're talking about the NFL, we're talking big dollars. You cannot use the term Super Bowl or Super Sunday without paying for the right to use that name. So you hear things like the World Series of Football, the big game, Sunday's big game, the pigskin showdown. Those are all terms that haven't been copyrighted that people can use to try and glom onto it. In, in looking into some things, I found out the limit for showing a football game, even in your home, is a 55-inch screen. Technically, under the law, you show on a, a screen larger than 55 inches and invite someone in, you could be held in violation of the copyright. It's crazy. Now, in, 19, in 2008, when they came out with this stuff, you know, a 55-inch screen was a pretty big deal. Um, now, let me just talk about the dollars for a second. In 2011, Budweiser paid 1.2 billion, billion with a B, dollars for the rights for six years to use their logo in their advertising. Now, to put that in a different perspective, a billion is a thousand million. Or in a different way, a billion seconds ago, it was 1959. A billion minutes ago, Jesus Christ walked on this earth. If you had a billion dollars and spent $10,000 every day, it would take you 275 years to spend it all. If you spent, <laughs> if you spent $1,000 an hour, probably be in Congress, but that's a different thing. <laughs> if you spent $1,000 an hour, it would take 114 years to spend that much money. Oh, my goodness. A billion dollars ago was less than three hours at the rate it spent in Washington, D.C. So the dollars, the logos, all of that, the NFL, to some, is a pretty big, uh, pretty big deal. For a high school, uh, a high school uh, player that wants to get on the team, I mean, that's a big deal to get on, on the football team. And then to play well so you can, you can go to college, maybe get a scholarship, but just for the joy of playing the game because, you know, you want to set that goal to play for the NFL. For professional players and coaches, getting to the Super Bowl is a dream. For those who have been there and lost in the past, just getting there is not the goal, but getting there and winning. They want to be champions. I'm afraid Christians way too often we're satisfied with just being on the team. We just want to show up. And it doesn't always work that way. It shouldn't work that way. Getting on the team is where the work begins. So I want to draw some comparisons to Super Bowl players and being Super Bowl champion Christians. So just like the game being played this evening, there are a couple of different aspects that we need to look at. You've heard it said that there's no I in team. 
But there are two eyes in dedication. There are three eyes in discipline. With dedication and discipline, those are what's required to get to your full potential. In team sports, or even in business, it's a, a group of people working together for a common goal. A team makes things happen. This also applies to the church. And so from that perspective, they say there is no I in team. But actually, if you look close, there is an I hidden there. To be champions, we need to have an offensive plan. So in your notes, an offensive plan is the first fill in there. In every football game, there's always a coin toss to see who's going to get a start and whether they're going to start on offense or defense. I think it's something that we should look at. And let's look at going on offense. First thing, go deep. On offense, the quarterback will call a pass play, and sometimes he'll tell his receivers to go deep, run way down the field, and I will throw it to you. Go deep. Now, when they've seen some of those, you know, when, when you look at the quarterback perspective and how far they can throw that ball and the accuracy, it's just mind-boggling. I've heard of quarterbacks in practicing, they tie a tire to a rope on a tree and then have someone swing that rope back and forth, and they would just stand back and practice throwing that football through that tire that was swinging. I just, the, it's the, uh, the talent that, that these quarterbacks have is just astounding to me. In Christian lives, in our Christian lives, we need to go deep too. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Another version puts it this way. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Psalm 119, 11 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Whether it be the football game or whether it be our Christian lives, we need to go deep. Second thing, we need to run hard or run with intensity and strength. Joshua 14, 8 said, as Joshua said, but I wholly followed the Lord. I did everything the Lord told me to do. Paul the Apostle in 2 Timothy said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The third thing we need to do is to keep getting up. Life is going to knock you down. Life is going to set you back. I got to tell you that, you know, in, in watching these, watching a football game, some of these hits these guys get, I wouldn't survive out there five minutes. I think I need to take some Excedrin, you know, just after some of those hits I see on the field. It's, it's amazing. But what do they do? They bounce right back up, and they're ready to go at it again. Why? Because they're dedicated. That's why they're there. Their whole lives are wrapped around that. Coach Vince Lombardi once said, it does not matter how many times you get knocked down. It matters how many times you get back up. And that's the way it is with our Christian life. Problems are going to come. Sometimes they come in the mail. Sometimes, sometimes they come on a telephone, so I don't answer that phone anymore. Uh, <laughs> I mean, problem, you, you don't have to go out looking for trouble. It'll come find you, I guarantee you. That's why I don't understand why some people insist on going out looking for trouble. Problems will come. But, as we learned this morning, the Lord said, in this life you will have trouble, but I will be with you. Now, it's not in your notes, but add one here. Go for the score. Show your intentions. Plan to score. Plan to get to the end. The scriptures, uh, we're all looking as Christians for the Lord to say to us, well done, well done, thy good and faithful servant. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, Every man that striveth for the mastery 
is temperate in all things. Now that's specifically geared toward the athletic games and the prize. Let me read it another way. And every man that striveth in athletic games for the mastery, the prize, is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So just as an athlete trains themselves and disciplines themselves, we need to do that in our Christian life also. So in our offensive plan, there are four eyes. Go deep, immerse yourself. Run hard, show intensity. Uh, three, keep getting up, insistence on persevering. And four, going for the score, our intention is to do what we're out there to do. To be a Super Bowl champion Christian, you have to have an offensive plan, but just as important is we need to have a defensive plan. And we're going to talk in Ephesians chapter 6 for a few minutes. One of the defensive plans is defend against the run and pass. Defend against the run and pass of Satan. Satan came after Jesus with everything he had. And he constantly came after Jesus trying to tempt him. Chuck Bednarik of ESPN, he said, A linebacker is like an animal. He's like a lion or a tiger, and he goes after his prey. He wants to eat them. He wants to kick the... Can't read that. He wants to kick something. <laughs> That's what a linebacker is. In high school, Aaron Gibson was six foot six and weighed over 440 pounds. Wow. He was drafted into the NFL. He slimmed down to a slim 410 pounds. <laughs> but at six foot six and 410 pounds, he was the largest, biggest guy ever to play professional football. Can you imagine <laughs> going up to the line and having that facing you on the other side? That's just mind-boggling to me. But the percentage of these guys that are over 300 pounds is just absolutely amazing. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. That word devour also means engulf, submerge, overwhelm, destroy, annihilate. You ever had something happen in your life where you felt like you were submerged? Or you felt like you were overwhelmed? Or you felt like you were being destroyed or annihilated? It could be the devil. It could be Satan working against you to ruin your testimony or to steal your happiness. Satan will constantly run at you and try and crush you and try and destroy you. And as I've mentioned before, Satan does not want to destroy you because he wants you. He wants to destroy you so that God cannot use you effectively. We have to defend against the run and the pass of Satan. Next thing we have to do is we have to uh, we have to beware of the reverse, which is deception. In football, you've seen it. Quarterback gives gives the run of the ball, and then he runs back like he's going <coughs> to throw it, and then everyone starts moving, but the ball is over there. And some teams do it very effectively, and, and some teams catch it sometimes. And if the guys on the front are doing their line, are doing their job. Uh, they blocked it so, so he could run. And some of those running the balls work very well, and other times they seem to get crushed. But it's, it's deception, and you're going to see it a lot today if you're watching the game. The deception on the opponent's part to get your defense off balance. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand safe against all of the strategies and tricks of Satan. Look up the word that they use for strategies and tricks 
and it came up with wily craftiness. Satan will do everything in his power to destroy you, destroy your effectiveness, to steal your joy. And here's the thing. He's got about 6,000 years of practice in beating up Christians. But Jesus said, I'll be with you. Next one is the sweep. The sweep of discouragement. I think all of us have gotten discouraged at one time or another. You know, anyone who says they never did get discouraged, you know what, if they'll lie about that, they'll lie about other things too. All of us get discouraged. But it's like Vince Lombardi. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. And you've only got to get back up one time more than you've been knocked down. Discouragement. We all face it. Psalm 73, verses 2 through 4. says, But I almost stumbled and fell, because it made me jealous to see proud and evil people and to watch them prosper. They never have to suffer. They stay healthy. Well, you know, again, we've talked about it before. You know, people that post things on social media, they do the highlight reel. They only, you know, they only, only post the good stuff. And if you read that, it, it, it's like uh, you think no one else ever has any problems like I do. No, no, they're not telling you the whole story. I find it fascinating that a part of the... Uh, political process out there. You know, the, the, the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not covet other people's houses and other people's money and other people's what. You shall not covet the Ten, ten Commandments. But there are people out there that says, Yeah, we're going to take those rich people. We're going to take all their money and we're going to give you free stuff. And in fact, that's the way the government's been operating for many years. Take Take money through uh, taxation and then give people free stuff. Here's something to think about. If the IRS took 100% of all the people that make over a million bucks a year, if they took 100% of their income, that would run the government for less than 60 days. Now, uh, there's one candidate proposing a 90% tax rate. Why not raise it to 100%, put these people out of business, and you run the, business, run the government for less than two months? Let me tell you what the reality is. The reality is the rich people don't have enough money. It's the middle class. It's you and me, kiddo. That's where the money is. And so if they can't get it from the bigs, even if they took it all from the bigs, they're still going to have to tap you and I. There is no free lunch. My mama's been telling me that for years. Satan does everything he can to discourage you. Satan is coming to tempt you. And if he can do it by making you jealous of someone else that seems to have more than you, he'll do that. If he can make you envious and covet something that somebody else has, so you look at what you have and think, eh, this is no big deal. But it Again, those of us average people, we live better than most everyone else on the planet. Keep our eyes on the Lord, and he will give us what we need. Psalm 59, once David said, Deliver me from my enemies, O oh my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. The fourth thing we want to look at is up the middle. And that's doubt that he causes. Up the middle is the hardest place for a runner to run, but that's where more, most of the players of defense are. If your team is doing their job, they clear you, clear you a path while protecting the quarterback. You've seen it happen. Sometimes that guy gets the ball, and he's going to run it right up through the middle. And again, if, if those guys on the front block properly, boom, he's got a path to go. But it's a difficult. I mean, he's <laughs> Sometimes he just runs up through the middle and he hits a brick wall and everything collapses on him, too. There is a play up the middle. I don't know any Christian that has never had faith failures. But that's what the church is for. That's why the rest of us are here. To help encourage you. 
to help those that are doubting, to help those that, whether you're doubting his presence, whether you're doubting his love, whether you're doubting his concern, the rest of us are here because the chances of us all being down at the same time is not very good. Chances of us all up being at the same time is not very good either. But enough of us are up, enough of us are having, that we can be helpful to one another and encouragement. That's what the church is for. That's why the Lord instituted it that way. Got another one here, not in your notes, but add this in. Watch the pass. Watch the pass. The devil is going to throw darts at you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In biblical times, the military would use bows and arrows and would put a material around the uh, arrowhead and then light it before shooting it so that when it hit, even if it didn't hit exactly the mark, the flame would burn <coughs> and it would cause damage. Satan shoots fiery darts at us. We need to have the shield of faith. When you look in Ephesians at the armor that the Christian has, one thing you'll notice, there's nothing for your back. It's all forward. So if you turn around to run, you have no protection. All of the protection that it talks about in Ephesians is for a person who's moving forward. It protects the front. Jude wrote, contend for the faith. The Lord left us here on this earth to be an encouragement to other people, but to also to preach the gospel, to propagate the gospel. The last thing here is be part of a special team. Now, special teams are players who have special capabilities. Field co a goal kicker, punter. There are a number of them that they just come in for one play. Person to catch the ball and run it back. Person to kick the ball. Just a number of, uh, of special players. And each and every one of them have a job. And they might not, might not get the glory of the quarterback, but their performance can win or lose the game. Scripture tells us that every one of us has special spiritual gifts that the Lord has given us for the benefit of the body, for the benefit of those around us. You may be a creative type. You may be an accounting type. You may be a mechanical type. But God has given you a talent that you can use for the church. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus needs you and your entire team here needs you to help us propagate the gospel, to help us reach our community to help us strengthen our Christian brothers and sisters. On the team, together, everyone achieves more. A lot of people are just happy to make it to the game. But the difference is, like Joe Namath once said, if you're not going to go all the way, then why go at all? Through Christ, we can be the Christian that the Lord wants us to be. We're going to stand together and pray. If you need to, let's all stand together. If you need to do business with God, this is the time. Whether it be salvation, whether it be church membership, whether it be uh, baptism, whether it be getting more involved. This is the time. Let's pray together. Now, Lord, we're thankful for the opportunities to come here and gather. We're thankful for everyone who took time out of their day to come, and we just pray that you bless them for that. And, Lord, we pray that you would reveal your truth to our hearts, and you would reveal yourself to us, and let us know the things that you want us to do, that we can be more effective not only on our Christian community, but on the community that we live in. In your name we ask these things. Amen. Let's remain standing. Here you go.